Good evening. You're very welcome. Um, this is our last of our Easter week services, um, so it's great to see you. I think there is tonight. I think there is a cup of tea tonight. Yes. So you're very welcome tonight to stay for a cup of tea and a biscuit and and, and some fellowship after the service, and and we're very pleased to welcome um, Jim Ray tonight. Um, Jim, thank you very much for, for coming down. Um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say, and you're very welcome with us tonight. I don't think there's any announcements from the Strand side, bar one, which is just a reminder that the prayer meeting on Wednesday night um, is, is, isn't happening, so no prayer meeting this Wednesday. That will resume the following Wednesday. I think that's the only announcement there is. So we, we stand uh, and we'll sing Jesus Christ is risen today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we've been able to come together this last number of nights to consider and to reflect just on those uh, events around your death 2,000 years ago. We thank you that we've been able freely to meet together and that we've been able to join together in that uh, that fellowship to reflect on... uh, the horrors of the events leading to your death and then the celebration of of Easter Sunday today. We thank you for for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love. We thank you for we thank you for the grace, your grace and how you've come down from heaven. Uh, to, to be with us here uh, and, and you, you, you've given everything to us we thank you for it and we pray that as we reflect on that sacrifice that love and that grace that we ourselves would display those attributes in a way that all too often that we don't 
where all too often we're selfish and we're proud and we're stubborn and we're hard-hearted. We just pray that as we've reflected this week uh, through uh, our time together, that we would be loving, that we would be selfless, that we would be generous and that we would be full of grace. We just pray that this Easter we wouldn't um, come away from our time together, from these services and from these reflections and just carry on our lives as we so often do um, and, and push this sort of behind us. We confess that all too often um, as we consider the Easter story and the story of your great love and your sacrifice for us, that it can wash over us sometimes. It can. We're so familiar, in a sense, with the story that, that, that maybe it can just pass us by to some extent and that we can come to these services and, 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 and hear the stories but not maybe feed them and feel it in our hearts. We just pray that that wouldn't be our experience this Easter, that we would reflect in you and, and, and be brought to our knees with the powerful realisation of your, of your love and sacrifice for us and that we would leave here tonight changed and that we would reflect that love in our own lives in this area in Sydney. So we thank you for this time. We thank you for your love and your grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading, our first reading tonight is um, Isaiah 53. Hopefully the words will come up. Yeah. Isaiah, Isaiah 53. You haven't got Isaiah 53? Well, don't worry. I have Isaiah 53 in front of me, so I'll, I'll, I'll simply read it. Um, so it's Isaiah 53. This is the word of God. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been, been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who, and who could speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through, the, and through the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. I will stand again to sing in Christ alone.
The next reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Amen. We'll, we'll uh, bow our heads again in prayer. Let's pray again. Mm-hmm. Lord, as we pray that we would be uh, changed this Easter and that we would carry out our, our, our work in Sydney here in a different way, in a way that's pleasing to you, we also pray for your church worldwide. And we know there's tremendous oppression and suffering parts of Southeast Asia in particular, in Africa, the Middle East. We pray for your church in these parts of, in these parts of the world. We pray for those um, Christians living in these places where celebrating this Easter time would result in severe persecution, maybe even imprisonment and death. We pray for those people that you would strengthen them, that you would give them resolve, that you would be close to them. And it's easy for us here in the, in, the, in the comfort of Western living and when the persecutions we face are so slight and small, it's easy for us to, in a sense, ask that they would um, remain faithful, but we do pray that they would be faithful to you. And we pray that we would be faithful in supporting them in our prayers and our givings. We pray for those missionaries working across, across, the, across your world. And again, we pray that they would be strengthened in difficult and trying circumstances. We pray that they would hold fast to your word and they would be encouraged. And again, that we would do our best to encourage those people serving overseas. And we pray for those serving closer to home as well. And again, as the circumstances may be different, the persecutions may not be not so acute, may not be so obvious. There's discouragement because of the apathy maybe that we experience. So we can, well, we can feel that ourselves. There's so much apathy um, in our society. And so we, we pray that uh, for ourselves and for those working in, in our society in, in the UK and Ireland and in Europe, that they wouldn't be discouraged they would be excited at the possibilities and how you work and how you've worked 
uh, through your people both in the past and, and, and here and now. And whilst there may be apathy, there, there may also be a, a sense of people being open to, 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 to spiritual matters and that there may be ways in there. We pray too for, for, for those parts of the world and those places where we see suffering before us daily. In fact, at times we can, we can barely look at the news, watch the news, we will switch it off almost because the suffering is just so unimaginable and so tragic. And, and we think in particular of places like Syria where it just seems uh, there's no solutions and uh, the situation seems so intractable and we can barely even watch it. And we pray for other situations too, similar situations across the world uh, that, that just the problems seem insurmountable to us in our humanness. But as we think at this Easter time of, of, of your message, we, we pray that something of that message would, would, would come to those players in those situations and that they would turn to you, that, that, that they would, their hearts would be softened, and that your ways would, would, would shine through. And we pray for governments and leaders, particularly in the West, that the peace would prevail and that situations there would change, and would change, change for the better. Pray too for our own province here, and um, it was Easter 20 years ago. We talked about the Good Friday Agreement that 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 the, the peace accord was was drawn up. Um, no doubt there'll be lots of commemorations or, or celebrations of the of the 20th anniversary of the of the Good Friday Agreement. And as we look at it, we look at our own government and we look at our own communities, and can we really say that we have? in these last 20 years, come together as communities in an appreciable and appreciably different way. And whilst we've had the benefit of, of relative peace for the last 20 years, for which we thank you, we know deep down that a lot of the, the barriers, the, 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 the things that divide us remain, um, maybe in our hearts as much as anything else. And so whilst again we can be discouraged at the lack of progress, and we can be discouraged at the the failure to form a government and a failure to move our society forwards. And we can be discouraged by those divisions that we see every day and, and where people live and where we're educated in our home and every, in every aspect of our lives. Equally, we, we pray that again your word it would prevail in the hearts of those in leadership, in the hearts of those um, in the cool face. And that true reconciliation would take place here in our land, in our province, and that we wouldn't have 20 years, um, like the last 20 years, and there would be true reconciliation, true coming together. We thank you for the, the, this time together. We thank you for these services, these last number of days. We just pray that this would have been a time, and has been a time of restoration for some. It's been a time great encouragement for others and we just pray that over these services that for those um, who maybe um, didn't know you before have come in here maybe for the first time uh, or maybe not but they would have been touched by what by, by, by your message and, and and the preaching and the teaching of these last few nights and we pray that souls would have been saved over this last week in Sydenham for you. And we pray for those, for all of us, and for those who maybe have been saved and have come, have come to you for the first time, but, but equally for, for those of us who have been saved some time ago, that we would um, go away from here in a different place, closer to you and on fire for you. We thank you for uh, what you've done for us. We thank you for the message of Easter and for this Easter Sunday, for the celebration of life over death, um, the defeat of sin, and we thank you for that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Graham, for your welcome. I'm delighted to be here this evening in Strand Presbyterian Church. 
Uh, you probably know that I'm a good friend of your minister, and he and I meet at a place on a Saturday afternoon to watch Dondella at the Hen Run. So I'm delighted to be here this evening and to share with you, see some of my friends from the Methodist Church at Sydenham and other friends who are familiar to me. You may have got a little handout as you've gone round, a little bookmark. You might want to bring that to hand this evening. It gives the outline of what I might want to say to you later. So good to be here and good to share with you. We're going to sing together the hymn, Jesus Christ, I Think Upon Your Sacrifice. Let's stand to sing. I recall my late mother, who sometimes was something of a pessimist, who took me through the streets of North Belfast after German bombing and showed me the ravages of the German bombers and would often ask the question, what if Hitler had won the war? Then of course when we moved house from a two up two down at seven and sixpence per week to a council house at 19 and sixpence per week, my mother would often say, what if we cannot afford the, the rent? It's interesting that the Apostle Paul asks that question, I would call it the great what if of the Bible. It is basically, what if, if Christ had not been raised from the dead? What would the consequences be? And the Apostle Paul outlines them in the verses that are before you. And then, in an amazing kind of way, he turns it all around to being positive, to say, on the other hand, this is not true, and we can claim the three great promises of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want tonight to look at those three great promises that we find in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's interesting, of course, that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ affects the past. It was a man called Frank Morrison, a barrister, a philosopher, a historian, and a Jewish agnostic who sought out to prove that Jesus 
had never been raised from the dead. Like Paul, who refers to such people who seem to be about in the early church, who do not recognize the resurrection and do not believe it, Frank Morrison attempted to address it. And so, through research, looking at the Gospels and the ancient writers of the first century, and researching the evidence that he found in the Gospel story, he came to the conclusion that, in fact, he could say with confidence that Christ had been raised from the dead. It changed his life and turned him into be a Christian. He wrote a famous book, which remains a classic, Who Moved the Stone? And so, as we look at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we first of all see that it affects the past. If Christ be not raised from the dead, then Paul says our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. In, that, in those songs we sang tonight, particularly in that song, In Christ Alone, we see clearly the amazing theological concept that when Christ died on the cross, he died for our sins, and he took the consequences and paid the debt for the sins of the world. Some years ago, I came into contact with a lady in East Belfast as I was investigating a story to see whether or not it was true enough. And so I went to see a lady in Derwent Street. Her name was Joan. Joan told me an interesting story that her great-grandfather, Peter Walsh, was a stoker on the Titanic. She went on to tell me that after the Titanic had sunk, her great-grandmother received a telegram from the White Star Line, which said, Missing, presumed dead. There was some mourning in the little East Belfast streets at the death of this man who was a stoker on the Titanic. But then they became rather euphoric and rejoiced when one day, about two weeks later, he arrived in a little jaunting car in the street with his mate, and they thought they had seen a ghost. What happened was that Peter Walsh had gone into a pub in Southampton, had got drunk, and had been replaced by another stoker that the White Star Line hired from the docks. Joan said to me that day, it was the only occasion on which she could say, Guinness is good for you. <laughs> what he went through his life was saying was this, that somehow or other, another man died in his place. But we go further. Joan is in the Baptist church down in D Street. And one night, a preacher speaks about Christ dying for me, Christ dying in my place. She thinks about the story for a moment, and somehow or other she comes to the amazing conclusion that in a different and much more significant way, Christ died for her. Her, her great-grandfather lived a long life but died, but Christ rose again, and she then made this amazing discovery that transformed her life, that Christ had paid the penalty for her sin on the cross, that he had died in her place. And we always need to affirm that and understand it. No matter how you view the cross, and there are many ways of viewing it, there are many theologians that write about various aspects of the atonement. Central to it all is the notion that Christ died for my sins. He took my place. In my place. Condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Paul says, He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be through him the righteousness of God. That every day I live fascinates me 
and amazes me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me, says Charles Wesley. That's what the cross and the resurrection is all about, that Jesus Christ died for you and me. That becomes the moment of enlightenment for the unbeliever. Suddenly, in a wonderful way, the light goes on. The penny drops when you realize that Christ died for you on the cross and that the risen Lord Jesus can meet with you. Paul is there saying, if in fact he says there is no resurrection from the dead, then you are to be pitied, says Paul in this passage of scripture. You are to be pitied. You are miserable. But he says, and your sins are not forgiven. But that is not the message that he goes on to explain. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. And we rejoice today that our sins are forgiven. I come across people constantly in the life of the church who have issues with the past, who struggle in their lives to put to bed some issue, some sin, some misdemeanor that they have gone through in their life and they can't quite understand how it can be dealt with. But the Bible makes it clear when Christ forgives your sin, he wipes it clean and he wipes it out. A Pentecostal pastor of mine was preaching one night in the north of England and he told me a story and I've often found it amusing that he was a man with a wry Ulster sense of humor. Preaching that night in the north of England, he had a woman come to him at the end of the service and she said to him, Pastor, I've listened to what you've said tonight. I've been helped by it, but I want to say this. There is one thing that happened in my life some years ago, and from that I can never be forgiven. Being an Ulster man, he said to her, well, that's interesting, because he said, it's obvious that you believe the Bible, which says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from some sins. Oh, she looked at him. She knew the Bible well enough to know he was misquoting it. Well, he said, that's what you believe. Some sins. But the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Every day and every moment, the Christian believer needs to claim that promise. But then Paul goes on to talk about faith being futile. He says, if, if, if this is, hasn't happened then your faith is futile. It's of absolutely no purpose. It's almost like as if you're following a cause. You know, whether it be a, a Republican cause or a loyalist cause, you're, you're following a cause. These people are dead, they're in cemeteries. People walk to them and, and, and celebrate their lives, but they are of no value whatsoever. But what Paul is saying is this, that faith is a living, transforming experience. That is, that it is not only that we can say something happened in the past, but we're saying something vital is happening in the present. That is, that we are to experience a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. About two months ago, I went to do a funeral in North Belfast for Beatrice Stewart, an 88-year-old lady who was in the Tennant Street care home. Beatrice, I knew in a past life, was a wonderful Christian in the Methodist Church and a Sunday school teacher. She was, of course, in the frailty of life. And I knew something about her that might happen on the day of her funeral. And so when she died, I asked the relatives, will Carol be at the funeral? Oh, said the relative to me, Carol is flying from London to be at the funeral. I was hoping that she'd be there. I know Carol quite well. I met her some years ago. And so when she arrived at the funeral, there were 10 people in the funeral church. Uh, I said to Carol, would you like to say a word at this funeral about your Auntie Beatrice? And then she stood up. What a moment. She said, I was on the streets of Belfast. I was homeless. 
I was a druggie. And everything that you can name, I did it. And I was completely in a mess. She said, one day I thought, there is only one Christian in my family that I know. It is my Auntie Beatrice. She went to Caledon Street on the Shankill to see her Auntie Beatrice. She said to Auntie Beatrice, could you give me a Bible? And so Auntie Beatrice gave her a Bible but always apologized that the Bible she gave her, the zip didn't work. Well, Carol went with the Bible and as she said, she read it. She read the gospel stories and what happened? She said it in the funeral church. I met with Jesus. What's Carol doing today? Carol is a worker with the London City Mission. She works with the homeless on the streets of London and she witnesses to the wonderful experience of the transforming grace of God. What had happened? The Word of God wasn't just something you'd read. The Word of God became the living Word that she had experienced, that Christ became the Word. Truly, as, it, as John says in the Gospel, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. And what happened there was that Carol beheld the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and her life was transformed. That's what the Gospel is about. Somehow or other, we can experience that. We have an experience of the living Christ. It is the fact that Christ is encountering us day by day. He walks with me and he talks with me. He is with me all the time. And we have found a friend, oh such a friend, Jesus Christ, and we have encountered him. That is the gospel message. Faith is not futile. Faith is the most wonderful thing that we can ever experience. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, the Apostle Paul speaks about the life to come. He speaks about that those who are fallen asleep are lost if there's no resurrection. We are to be pitied. He speaks about what would happen if Christ had not been raised from the dead. The truth of the matter is this, that when Christ was raised from the dead, his risen body will be like what we will be in the life to come. I don't think for a moment we will look like Christ, but we will have the body of the resurrection. And as Paul says later in this chapter, this perishable will take on, it will become imperishable. This mortal will take on immortality. Now anybody who's here tonight who's my age knows what it is to be mortal. I didn't make the sunrise service this morning at the Methodist church at six o'clock. I was going to the toilet for the third time. You see, old age. I didn't make it. I have to get my pills into me every morning and I'm stiff and I have to sort of feel dreadful for a while and then I feel a bit better. You know about that, some of you, don't you? But Paul is saying we're going to have a new body. It's not going to be perishable, it's going to be imperishable. It is amazing and Peter says it is kept in heaven for you until the last day. Mara was a homeless woman in Tosford House and she was a formidable character like many people who would be in a homeless hostel. So she didn't have her too many valuables. But the one valuable she had, she gave to me that I'd keep it. It was an unusual thing. It had originated as a canteen of cutlery but there was no cutlery in the box. When you opened it up, it looked like a theater. But here's the rub. It had been presented to the famous actor-actress, Barbara Windsor. So it was quite a, one might say, a valuable 
sentimental peace. Recognizing that a hostel is not the safest place, she gave it to me to keep. She said, would you keep that for me? And then she disappeared out of my life. I put it in my study. Five years later, I got a letter from her. She was living in Carlisle, requesting that I send the box that contained the cutlery back to her home. And I was glad to do so. I made sure it was registered with the post office that she could sign for it and receive it. I kept it for her. Peter says, it is kept in heaven for you until the last day. God is keeping it for you. This life in the present time is a temporary business. Turn up to Paul's 2, 2 Corinthians 5.1. He talks about the body being a tent. You're living in a tent. I, I used to live, go, go on holidays in tents. Packed that up a few years ago. Can't have that anymore. I don't want to get out of a sleeping bag and head for a place to have a shower at some time of the morning. I don't want that anymore. I don't want to be like my wife who was washed out one night in, in Castle Wellen and, and had to come home in the middle of the night and she was, she was almost floating down into the lake. I don't want tents anymore. But Paul says we live in a tent. And what he says is when the tent will be dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Isn't that a tremendous word. And what he says here in the later passage of the scripture is that the risen body of the Lord Jesus Christ is a prototype like unto. In the Jews when they brought the first fruits of the crop to offer it to the priest, it was the best that they could bring and it was hopeful that every other piece of the crop or fruit or whatever it would be would be like it. So what Paul is saying is that the indestructible body of the Lord Jesus Christ is what will be given to the believer on death and the hope of eternal life. What a great, precious and amazing promise. Life forevermore with Jesus Christ. Life in heaven. And as Paul says here in this amazing words, we have this hope. Our faith is not in vain. Our sins are forgiven. And this perishable will take on the imperishable. And as he says in another place, we shall be changed, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. I'm old enough to remember a famous Northern Ireland footballer called Danny Blanchflower. He was one of my heroes playing at half-back for Northern Ireland and also the captain of Spurs. What I want to tell you about Danny Blanchflower is this, that in 1961, he was approached by Eamon Andrews with the big red book, This Is Your Life, and he refused to go on. Andrews chased him for a time and eventually Danny Blanchflower lost his coat as Andrews grabbed the coat and he ran down the street in his shirt sleeves. He was not for doing. This is your life. And he refused to go on. Danny Blanchflower, well, that was perhaps because of the kind of person he was. He was a very modest man and a private man. He didn't want to be exposed to that program. They had to run another program, a repeat on the night. It was really a terrible moment for television. But Eamon Andrews never thought, what if? 
He never thought for a moment that any guest would refuse. What if? That's the question. That's the question I leave you with tonight. What if you refuse the benefits of the resurrection? Well, Paul says here, those who do will be lost. Those who accept it will be entering into the kingdom and will put on the imperishable. Does God give you the right to refuse? I believe so. I believe so. I don't understand the total sovereignty of God, but I do believe he gives you the right to say no. The right to refuse. What if? What if? When Beatrice Stewart died, that frail old woman inherited the promises of the kingdom and is with Christ. She spoke to me about the benefits of the future. Carol, her niece, spoke to me about the benefits of the past. Her sins were forgiven and she had a transforming, ongoing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ offers three things, and I've illustrated them tonight. Simply, the past is forgiven, death is defeated, men and women can encounter and live in a daily relationship of saving grace with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can have not just a hope, but the confident hope, the confident hope, of eternal life, of a new life. And I remember Derek Bingham, my good friend, saying to me one day when he was in good health, and he said to me one day, he said, I always like the way sometimes they translate that verse as Paul writes to the Philippians, to be with Christ, which is far better, but he says, I like it when they change it a little bit, and it says, to be with Christ, which is better by far. To be with Christ, that is better by far. And he said to me that day, the one thing I know about it is this, it's going to be much better. We give thanks to God for this day, for the Easter rising, the real one, the real one and the glorious, triumphant experience of the risen Lord Jesus and the hope of life forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your words to us, for those scriptures, for all that they mean, and for the hope that we have. Lord, we pray that we will have gained the benefits not to have a faith that's futile, not to have no hope of life eternal, and not to have experienced sins forgiven. Lord, we pray that all of these great and glorious things we'll have experienced tonight in Jesus' name. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And now your offering for God's work in this place will be received.
loving God, receive these gifts for the work of your church and the extension of your kingdom. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Sing the hymn, I serve our risen Saviour, and we'll stand to sing this great hymn, Living He Loved Me. You know, I think of Brian there, and uh, one day we had a service from the mission, and I still see that song being sung at the end of the TV. Uh, we played it that day, Living He Loved Me, and Stevie was singing it in, in great thrust. So we're going to stand and sing that hymn together, I serve our risen Saviour. Your birth we celebrate, your death we remember, and your resurrection in glory we await. And so together we say, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.